All right. Well, I think we will go ahead and get going. And for folks who will who will join a little bit late, that is perfectly OK. Uh, but welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our December Muni Summit on um, equitable energy efficiency and electrification efforts in municipal light plant communities. Um, we are so excited to have you all here and we're so excited to have our wonderful uh, group of panelists here who are, who are uh, deeply knowledgeable and, and working directly on these important issues. So uh, we're, we're excited for the, the, the uh, engaging conversation. Just a few logistics to keep in mind. Um, oh, and I should say, actually, my name is Logan Malik, and I am the interim executive director here at the Massachusetts Climate Action Network. Um, just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, right now, you should not be able to unmute yourself. Uh, however, as we go through the program and folks have an opportunity to unmute themselves to ask a question, we ask that when you're not asking a question, if you could stay muted, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please be sure to uh, share your name and the town you're calling in from in the chat. We always love to know uh, where folks are located. Um, additionally, you may have already seen this, but this webinar is already being recorded. So if you don't feel comfortable um, you know, being on that recording, um, it shouldn't be an issue uh, until the Q&A, but, but just you know, feel free to keep your video off. And it is 6.05, so we can go and get ahead and get started. Just a few things uh, before we jump in, I want to give a brief overview of MCAN. Uh, MCAN is the Massachusetts Climate Action Network, and we were founded back in 2000. Um, and we really believe that uh, it's all about local action. Local action at the end of the day is, is, uh, is an incredible tool and incredibly powerful at making fundamental change. And that change starts locally with a creative idea, an equitable solution, uh, local folks on the ground really working to improve their communities. And it works its way up onto the, the statewide level, uh, the regional level, and even the federal level. And so we work to support our over 65 chapters um, in making that local change. And we also work to support them in, in uh, advocating for statewide and regional policies that support local advocacy. It's all about local action. That is really, is really what, what we believe. And, and we work really hard to support it. And one of the ways that we support it and one of the ways that we focus on it is through our emphasis on municipal utilities. Uh, we believe that MLPs are the preferred utility. Um, and and you know, when, when working on and prioritizing climate, they can really be a leader across the state and across the country on this work. And so that is, is why we focus on, on uh, so much on, on the uh, 50 communities that are served by MLPs and it's why, why we host these Muni summits on a, on a very regular basis. So we have a wonderful agenda planned tonight. Um, as I mentioned, uh, with some excellent speakers, um, the agenda will, will look like this. We will first hear from, uh, from our speakers who will give a, a 10 minute, 10 to 12 minute presentation on, on one, and you know, aspect of, of this work. Um, we'll start with uh, Gabe Shapiro from All In Energy, who will kind of provide a big picture of you know, efforts on the ground to, to enhance equitable energy efficiency and electrification. Uh, we'll then hear from, from Kristen Dupree um, about some of the lessons that, that we've learned and that, that uh, uh, Abode has learned through this process, and then we'll get to hear about some of the efforts taking place on the ground in specific communities. So specifically uh, Hingham uh, through, through their uh, Electrify Hingham program, and then uh, Middleborough uh, through the, the local efforts taking place there. Uh, we'll then conclude by having a brief panel discussion while I will ask uh, our panelists some, some questions, and then we will move on to Q&A. Uh, that I will facilitate and folks will get a chance to unmute themselves and, and ask their question. 
So without further ado, I want to introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Gabe Shapiro. And Gabe is the co-founder and co-executive director of All In Energy. Um, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about what All In Energy does. But uh, Gabe has spent the last decade uh, working with communities and institutions to connect their constituents to clean energy technologies and services. Uh, in addition to co-founding All In Energy, Gabe has worked in several other organizations, including uh, Abode, Energy Sage, uh, Next Step Living, uh, just to name a few. And he's he's worked in those in those uh, those organizations on issues related to equitable energy efficiency and electrification. And through this work, Gabe has been a part of helping over 150,000 families, uh, including families in MLP communities, uh, save energy and money. Uh, he's also created hundreds of jobs and and saved hundreds of thousands of tons of greenhouse gases. Uh, through electrification. Uh, Gabe earned an MBA from MIT Sloan and also holds a bachelor's degree in business economics from Brown University. And with that, I will let you take it away, Gabe. All right. Thanks so much. Um, one minor, I, I love Energy Sage, but it's actually Sagewell was the company that I worked with. Um, so I will, uh, and, uh, and thank you for the, the, for the warm, warm intro. Um, yeah, if you just want to get to the, the, uh, all in energy intro slide, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> so all in energy is a 501c3 nonprofit that I founded, um, really leveraging a lot of my learnings from my previous career in the energy industry and, um, understanding all the benefits that energy programs brought to the communities I had worked with and the employees that had been on my teams and really wanting to take all those benefits and point them at the communities that need them the most. Um, so our mission, and if you can head to the next slide, is to accelerate an inclusive clean energy economy. We're both trying to get folks to adopt clean energy technologies, but make sure that that transition is inclusive and is benefiting folks who have historically been left out. And we sort of correct that as we go forward. Um, go ahead. So we're really working at the nexus of these two um, equity issues around energy in Massachusetts. Uh, we have these nation leading programs, mostly we are working in the uh, ratepayer funded mass save program, but the MLPs have wonderful programs as well. Um, but when you look at who those are benefiting, uh, there's these populations that I'll get into in a minute that um, are underrepresented compared to their representation in the uh, in the population. Um, so they're not benefiting from the programs, even though they're paying for them. And then at the same time, we have all these, because of all this public investment in clean energy programs, we have a thriving clean energy economy, which is amazing, and we need that. Um, but when you walk into the headquarters of some of these growing businesses, it, it is still an overwhelmingly um, white male dominated workforce, especially at the, the leadership level. And that's just another way that these communities who are not benefiting from the programs are also not benefiting from the, the economic opportunities provided by um, employment in the clean energy industry. So we're placing ourselves at the nexus, trying to attack both of these problems at the same time by engaging with these communities. Um, next slide, please. And what we're trying to do is bring the energy efficiency companies into these communities um, and help them um, reach these customer segments that uh, they have missed previously. I also work with them to be able to deliver equitable service to, to those types of folks um, who, in, the, in the communities that have been left out previously. And we're also helping um, community members find these companies and um, find job opportunities with them as well um, in a variety of different ways. Um, keep keep going. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the populations that have un been underrepresented. I will caveat with this or this audience of MLPs that all of this data and studies were conducted by the investor-owned utilities, the Mass Save program sponsors. Um, but I think the findings are applicable to not only other communities in Massachusetts, but also the rest of, of the country. Um, and basically what they found when they looked at who's participating in the repair funded programs that these three se customer segments um, were participating at lower rates. So those are moderate income households, uh, renter occupied land units. So that's both landlords and renters and limited English speakers, which is the census term for, for this population. But these are just generally folks that speak languages other than English. Um, so after finding that this this uh, 
that these that, that these populations were underrepresented. They obviously wanted to know why, so they conducted another study um, on the next slide here, which is the like trying to identify the barriers. Um, and this really resonated with my observation of these these problems, the the way that they named them um, and and sort of identified them like really match with my anecdotal experience of working with these populations to understand the barriers that they faced. Um, so they did a couple different studies, both a quantitative and a qualitative look at trying to um, attack which what these barriers were. Uh, the first one they identified is is just a trust barrier. Um, the it's it's not only that folks are like mistrusting of their um, utilities, which in some cases they are, or um, they're, I think that manifests itself more in like they're afraid to raise their hand and like, request services if they have like an overdue balance or um, have other issues in their home. But really where this really comes into play is there are unfortunately a lot of unscrupulous energy companies out there that have targeted these communities. So I'm talking about third-party energy suppliers. We're seeing more and more some more predatory uh, rooftop solar companies. And, and folks in these communities know, either have been or know someone who's been harmed by those companies. So when you start to talk to them about energy, they've really shut down immediately and are just like, we don't want to want to participate in this. We, we um, don't have the time to like diagnose what is a good and a bad program. And they just kind of just shut down and, and aren't interested in accessing those programs. The next one they up, talk about is prioritization. I would just, in addition to like, yes, they have other needs beyond energy efficiency. To me, this is just like a time barrier. So folks don't have the time to cut through the noise and find out which programs are good. They don't have time to research them. They don't have time to, you know, see a hear a radio ad and pick up the phone or see a billboard. Like they really um, have other pressing priorities in their lives. And they all, they, most people want to participate in these programs. They know they can save them energy and money. They care about the environment. Um, they want to, you know, improve the the health of their home, but it's just like, they have a lot of other, other uh, priorities. So you got to really make it, make it easy for them to access. Um, this relevance one is just kind of like people, uh, particularly for like renters, they'll, they'll see that their programs exist. Um, but they don't think it's for them. They don't think they're able to participate. Um, I, I should mention another uh, category uh, of um, per, uh, non-participants are small businesses, and they also face a lot of these same challenges. A lot of them are renting their spaces. Um, many are immigrant-owned, speak languages other, other than English, and like on the modern income side, often operating in shoestring budgets. And this is another one where like they don't businesses that are leasing their buildings don't don't think that they can participate in these programs when in fact there's there's often many many uh, measures that can be installed and then like knowledge I, I would call this awareness um just like knowing that the programs exist um and how they can benefit them are are out there um and then the one that is not identified here but is um just access so like I think it's not identified in the study but you know even if all of these things are in place, um, if you can't, you know, set an appointment in the language that you prefer to do business in or can't get um, someone to come out to your home that speaks that language, it really is difficult to access the program. Um, so that's just another another barrier. So I wanted to provide a couple a couple um, additional challenges that uh, apply to electrification. So um, <clears throat> which is a newish technology and is not, and especially in these communities, there's not a lot of examples of this happening. So um, it really, are, we are really are in the early stages of adoption. So everything on the previous slide, um, so all the all the previous barriers, plus we, um, especially for these, for communities that have um, a lot of folks who, who are lower moderate income, we're really concerned with the concern about increasing utility costs from shifting, especially from natural, natural gas to um, electric heating, uh, we've got a con concerns about just like the overall um, energy burden of the building, but also in some of these buildings that are heated centrally, like and metered electrically separately, um, shifting energy burden for heating to the tenants is a, is another concern. Um, there is just like gentrification and displacement when you get these fancy new beautiful heat pump systems. It's possible and like with a lot of um, subsidize subsidy subsidy from uh, the the programs. Um, the the landlords may think they are able to charge more rent, um, and folks might be just dis displaced. Um, there's the typical physical barriers in, in older buildings, but 
Um, some some of those barriers don't get in the way of doing weatherization and the and the basics or swapping out a traditional heating system, but might um, be a barrier for uh, installing heat pumps. And then again, like uh, the same barriers as before, but this wasn't listed on that other slide, but just like the access in other languages, uh, bilingual sales teams and customer service staff to really help people navigate this new technology. It really is hard to do that in the in a, a manner that is going to be, you know, translated by a family member or like not, you know, the direct communication with with uh, with the the sales or customer service staff. So just a couple highlights of some strategies, and then I have some some examples of of how All in Energy has approached this. But um, I think MLPs have a leg up uh, being part of of cities or and and, and city government. So. But I found working with with MLPs and working with investor-owned utilities that typically the relationships that um, residents have with their MLBs MLPs are are usually very positive. Um, so there's there's less uh, I think trust issues uh, there with, with those with the local delivery of these services. Um, but even when you have that that uh, benefit, really uh, leveraging local community groups, um, not only their trusting relationships but just their access to different. Um, community members to get the message out in a, in a place of trust and meeting people and, and like providing the ability to meet people where they are. Um, meeting people where they are, I think also I have two examples of this. One is just like physically reaching people where they are. So whether you're going door to door to promote a program or you are collaborating with the house of worship to um, in, engage after, after a faith service um, or tabling at a community event, like just really making it easy for people to learn about the program where in their normal course of business, but also like meeting them where they are and like what their needs, immediate needs are rather than like going from zero to, to heat pumps. You might want to talk to them about their electric bill um, first. Uh, and then thinking about the whole customer journey, there's like been a lot of efforts to do marketing in other languages, but then you're connecting people to a program that doesn't have the, the, to a vendor that doesn't speak those languages or like you're doing you know, outreach to landlords, but you don't really have a good way to deal with mixed income buildings or, you know, coordinate with tenants. And then again, when you, when, you know, there may be limited buildings that are going to like benefit from electrification using data to like find out where those buildings are um, or to like target limited resources on like the neighborhoods who need them the most. Um, so I'm running out of time. So we're going to cruise quickly through some of our examples. So this is our primary program. We're operating on behalf of the Mass Save program administrators. It really is like kind of leveraging this, the local knowledge and, and relationships of, of uh, municipalities and community-based organizations to reach out to the, the, the same populations that I referenced before. So we're operating, this is the first year of operating this program. We're working directly with um, 18 different programs covering 30 uh, participating communities. We have one MLP, Nora Nor Light. Um, that that's that's part of the part of the mix here. Um, four of them are led by local CBOs, and sixteen are led by um, by by the by the municipalities themselves. And you know, it's all all over the state. We're about to add fifteen more communities, including one more MLP next year. Um, and you can see that's like mostly environmental justice communities, renter occupied buildings, and lots of folks that that speak languages other than English. And in some of those communities, that number is much higher um, than that. Uh, go ahead to the next one. I'm going to actually, I think, skip this slide based on time. But this is a this is a, one of the one of the programs we did in in Cambridge where we were specifically targeting renters. Um, this is my physically meeting people where we are. This is mostly done with with canvassing, um, and we got a lot of renters into the pilot. And then we'll just go to the to the last one. This is my oops. The, yeah, this slide meeting people where they are and just like their energy knowledge. We've done this the service called an energy bill checkup where we're really just helping people look at their bill. Um, understand if they qualify, what rate they qualify for, and then uh, helping them get on a discounted rate, helping them get off third-party energy supply, and then um, also helping them access arrearage programs that the that the utilities offer if they need them. And that's been really helpful. Like people that's been universally valued by the folks that have participated in this program, um, and has been, you know, I think really helped people save um, money at the end of the day. It helps build trust to then make an ask to do one of these efficiency programs after you like help people with their basic needs on their bill. All right, that's it. I'm a minute over. Sorry, Logan. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, happy to answer questions, but here's my contact information and I will kick it back over to Logan. Thank you so much, Gabe, for that, uh, that really interesting presentation. And I think 
helps to to ground to ground the discussion really nicely. Um, so I am going to I'm going to keep things going. I'm sure folks have a lot of questions. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to drop them in the chat, and we'll get to them uh, or or hold them so that that we can answer them at the end. Um, but I do want to keep us keep us moving along um, at, with our, our next speaker, uh, Kristen Dupree. Um, Kristen is the, the Vice President of Strategy and Development at Abode Energy Management. Uh, and uh, at, at this role, she brings a decade of experience uh, building and managing energy efficiency, demand response, and electric vehicle programs. Uh, including at organizations like Ener uh, Energy New England, uh, Clear Results, and Conservation Services Group. I hope I got that list right this time. My apologies, <laughs> Gabe. Um, uh, and Kristen, in, in this role, is, is focused on developing new programs for a boat. Uh, and with the broader lens of electrification, she is building the resources and the partnerships that will allow a boat uh, to provide impactful service services as uh, they continue to focus on decarbonization. Uh, Kristen holds a bachelor's degree in finance from Bentley University and an MBA from Clark University. And with that, take it away. Thanks, Logan. Um, this is actually my um, third time presenting at a Muni Summit. Uh, my first two times I was with Energy New England. So this is the first time uh, representing Abode and uh, I appreciate you having me here. Um, so uh, to get started, just a little bit about Abode Energy Management for those of you who might not be familiar with us. Uh, we're an energy consulting and program administrator located in Concord. We have about 32 employees right now. We're the lead vendor for the Mass Safe program, managing home performance contractors throughout the state. We oversee approximately half of the residential weatherization and energy efficiency work done in Massachusetts. Um, we also focus on residential decarbonization as the lead technical and implementation consultant for the decarbonization pathways pilot for the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And we run heat pump adoption programs for nine MLPs and six communities in Massachusetts, as well as for the entire state of Connecticut for Energize Connecticut. I also wanna do a quick plug for a new initiative that we're doing. Uh, we've started providing community advocate heat pump training for community volunteers. Uh, this is a 10 to 12 hour training on heat pump technology, uh, basic building science, home mechanical systems, and um, like effective advocacy strategies. Um, so that's something new and exciting that we're doing. So, uh, so as I mentioned, um, you can go to the next one, Logan. Um, I'm gonna just start by, um, giving an overview of the heat pump adoption program that, uh, that we do with nine MLPs. Uh, so we started this in like early to mid 2020 with five or so MLPs and we added um, a few more in 2021 to get us up to nine. Um, so just with these MLPs, we've conducted over 2,600 homeowner consultations um, and we've provided quality assurance on 1,300 uh, projects. Um, and we've expanded these services with several of the MLPs to include weatherization and solar support services. Next slide. Uh, so the goals of the program are to increase adoption of air source heat pumps, obviously, provide actionable customer education, um, increase customer satisfaction and contractor success, and prevent sizing and performance issues. And this approach includes educating and empowering customers to make informed decisions, uh, including helping them evaluate quotes, um, engaging contractors by creating local contractor networks and providing uh, quality assurance uh, so that we provide oversight at like meaningful stages in the process. Uh, next slide. Um, so as um, you all may know, uh, getting heat pumps is really complicated and there are often multiple barriers to overcome. And homeowners need help 
Um, so we provide impartial objective advice on heat pumps so homeowners can um, you know, make informed decisions with confidence. And we prepare them to talk to contractors um, and we provide help deciphering quotes uh, and, and comparing, comparing multiple quotes, that sort of thing. Um, we support homeowners throughout the process from like the very uh, early education stage to helping them troubleshoot uh, complicated technical uh, issues with their installer. So this slide shows the number of consultations that we've done with MLPs by month, you know, averaging um, consistently now over 100 a month. Um, and in 20, just earlier this year, MassSave also started offering a similar uh, consultation. And as I mentioned, uh, we've contracted with Energize Kinetic to offer this uh, consultation program with them statewide. So this consulting concierge concept is spreading, and I believe we'll see it expand for water heating, battery storage, and other decarbonization technologies. Next slide. Uh, this is just a sample of our quote comparison report. So uh, through providing these consultations, uh, we became uh, understood that a major pain point for the customer uh, was the um, it, not just a major pain point, we're also seeing customers drop off when they were going to get quotes and comparing quotes. Um, the problem being that there's no uniformity or consistency with what information they're being provided. Um, and, you know, it was like difficult or impossible to pair, compare them on anything other than like the total price and how much they liked the salesperson. Um, so we developed this tool. Um, to help homeowners have like an informative side by side, very visual comparison. And, you know, as you can see, it's, um, it's quite comprehensive and it's also uh, customized for, um, for homeowners. Next slide. Uh, we curate and manage a participating contractor list of heat pump uh, providers for the MLP, uh, making it easier for customers to start um, the process. We proactively engage with contractors to ensure that the customers are taking advantage of the MLP's incentives. Um, and then we also like ensure that the contractors remain compliant with program processes. And when we compare the quality and compliance between the, uh, the PCL and the non-PCL PCL installer groups, uh, we can see that participating contractors tend to have more systems that you know, adhere to sizing and and design best practices compared to the non-participating contractors. And um, also they, you know, they adhere better to the utility processes and requirements. Um, next slide. So um, over the last two years of running these programs, we've collected a lot of really good data. And so I just grabbed some that I thought might be interesting for this group. Uh, this data shows, uh, this is, um, is from 1,300 um, projects that we um, reviewed. Um, and it shows some kind of interesting and promising trends. So um, one thing that you can see is that um, the price of heat pumps has increased over the past two years. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, but you can see that it's increased by 16%. Uh, but we also see that project sizes are bigger. Uh, both in BTUs and in the in the amount of condition space that they're covering. Um, we're seeing more and more whole home solutions as well as more ducted and mixed ducted systems versus, you know, mini splits. Um, and then at the same time, we're also seeing um, that BTUs per square feet are going down, which kind of shows um, that contractors are sizing equipment. Um, it go, you know, going in the right direction by not oversizing it. So it's great. Um, so having been part of the design of this program, I can tell you that um, little attention was given to equity. Um, some MLP programs do have like a low or moderate uh, income incentive that's a little bit higher than the, the normal um, heat pump incentive. And some have done some targeted outreach to some you know, specific customer seg segments. 
but equity is not a part of the program design and it's not really how we uh, measure program success for these programs. So, um, you know, how do we move these programs forward in a way that creates equitable outcomes? As Gabe mentioned, one of the barriers to providing equity um, is substandard building stock that have physical barriers to providing energy efficiency measures. Um, things like not into wiring, vermiculite, mold, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to weatherize homes before we electrify them. And so, you know, putting um, programs in place to fund barrier mitigation in MLP towns um, is an important step that can be taken. Um, there are also like limits on the amount of federal funds uh, that can be used for barrier mitigation and low income programs. Um, so, you know, what I think happens a lot in MLP towns is um, you know, when the cost of barrier mitigation exceeds what the uh, WAP agency can spend, the house doesn't get, um, you know, the services that it needs in order to weatherize and then eventually electrify. Um, most homes, uh, especially small homes, will need electric service upgrades to handle the additional load of decarbonization. Um, IRA rebates uh, for this are coming. So, you know, figuring out how to make this happen in mass uh, with the utilities is also a great next step. And as we start um, thinking about um, strategies to lower operating um, cost with these new technologies, uh, because even though most MLPs have a lower electric rate than the IOUs, the operating delta from gas systems to heat pumps doesn't always pencil out, um, especially if the homeowner is on fossil fuel heating assistance, and then they lose that when they convert to, you know, clean heating. Um, so, um, you know, I think there's lots to think about here, and um, I look forward to continuing the discussion and hearing other people's thoughts on this. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kristen. That that was really uh, helpful to kind of get that overview and, and see see some of those lessons um, that have been learned um, and some really fascinating data uh, presented. So thank you so much. Um, I want to go to our next speaker who we are very happy to have, uh, and that is Brianna Bennett. Uh, Brianna is the sustainability coordinator at the Hingham Municipal Light Plant, and in this role, Brianna is responsible uh, for developing policies related to state and local electrification goals, overseeing HMLP's energy efficiency programs, uh, and promoting sustainable development strategies for the customers of HMLP. Uh, she also manages HMLP's communications, including the website and social media outreach. Uh, so she, she works across many spaces. Uh, and uh, Brianna holds a bachelor's degree in environmental sustainability studies and uh, political science from Merrimack College. Uh, she is also currently um, pursuing her master's in sustainability studies at the Harvard Extension School. Uh, and with that, go ahead and take it away, Brianna. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Logan. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with you all representing the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant and the Electrify Hingham program. I started working at HMLP one year ago, as of this week, actually, and it's been really exciting to explore what part an electric utility can play in community-wide electrification and how we can identify and target the needs of our ratepayers. Um, so. Uh, this program is an opportunity to collaborate with stakeholders so that we can achieve our collective goals of transitioning away from fossil fuels. The evolving roadmap for decarbonization, uh, decarbonizing our communities is riddled with challenges that hopefully programs like Electrify Hingham can help overcome on a local level. We intend to use a combination of financial investment and incentive programs, transparency of information, public meeting access, education, and hands-on customer engagement to make decarbonization happen. 
It's about closing the gaps and getting customers over hurdles so they can choose electric options, get solar, install heat pumps, et cetera, and we can make sure that the grid is fully prepared to meet those goals. Next slide, please. So Electrify Hingham aligns itself with HMLP's mission statement, which highlights HMLP's primary purpose and promise to the ratepayers. It's essential that everything we do as a utility is grounded in providing electricity, and then within that, making sure that electricity is affordable, uh, that it is consistently available and resilient, and that is a, it is eventually 100% carbon free. So we have this statement, and the ultimate question is, how do we strive to make it happen? Uh, this past year, HMLP has been working with its legal team, light board, and community groups to identify where people are getting left behind on electrification. And we're trying to figure out moving forward how to close those gaps. Electrification and efficiency programs have benefits on the grid as a whole and our entire ratepayer base. There are also direct benefits to the ratepayers that choose to move forward with projects, but we need to make sure that every ratepayer can reasonably choose to utilize our programs and participate in Electrify Hingham. At least 20% of HMLP's customers are renters, many of whom are not allowed to change the heating system for their unit or install weatherization, but they are typically the electric customer who's paying into our programs. So any ratepayer should be able to comfortably use our incentive programs and consider electrification, not just single family households or wealthy homeowners. Uh, we are looking at affordability concerns for all of our customers and especially low income customers. On our public light board meetings, we have considered tiered rebates that would enable low income and middle income customers to take advantage of our programs. Uh, developing those kinds of programs, though, is something that we're going to have to visit again. Financing options are being discussed with the state for MLPs, and we're hoping that solutions for customers to access that upfront project financing is going to be available in some capacity in the next year. There is also the general issue of many, many people still not knowing about any of this. Uh, there are people that are being left behind simply because it's never crossed their radar screen. So we're really hoping to get our hands around a successful media campaign over the next year and learn what connects with customers and what doesn't. Next slide, please. Uh, there are four categories that Electrify Hainham focuses on to move HMLP and the town of Hainham into the future, and that would be buildings, transportation, distributed energy resources, and partnerships. I'm going to briefly walk through what each of these categories means for us as a utility and for the customer, but I'll also add you're just seeing how we're choosing to brand our initiatives under Electrify Hainham and package all this information together for customers. A lot of utilities are offering these programs with different ways of organizing and promoting them. So in Hainham, we estimate that there are between 7,000 to 8,000 residential homes. And as of 2021, over 4,000 of those homes were running on oil for heating, and about 3,500 of those homes were using natural gas. Heat pumps are the electric solution right now that we're getting buildings off of fossil fuels with, and that's one of the biggest things that Electrify Hainham is going to be releasing education materials, infographics, and media on. But before we put heat pumps in the hands of customers, we need to reduce wasteful electric loads. So energy efficiency reduces a customer's consumption on their electric bill, requires a smaller heating system to be installed, and saves HMLP from purchasing more expensive or non-renewable power on the market. To capitalize on efficiency benefits, we require a no-cost home energy assessment to be performed as a first step. HMLP's assessments are conducted by Energy New England, uh, and then customers can work off of a tailored list of weatherization projects like insulation and air sealing that bring down that consumption and get additional money towards their heat pump system. So HMLP also rebates efficient Energy Star appliances and LED lighting retrofits for commercial customers. Other things you might see utilities offer could be rebates for refrigeration controls or electric lawn equipment. Um, we don't have those programs right now, but we do envision that a successful Electrify Hainum campaign includes the continuous ability for customers to tell us what they want through outreach efforts, contact forms, and social media. So on top of all of our incentive programs, uh, we want to be doing outreach and sharing resources with customers to make that process easier. We work with Boat Energy to provide customers with no-cost heat pump consultations, participating contractors, quote comparisons, and technical expertise. For all of our programs and throughout the Electrify Hainum webpage, we provide these other resources that you see. Uh, we have some very basic downloadable printable decarbonization plans, which are essentially Electrify Hainum in checklist form. <laughs> And then a lot of our customers have an easier time with paper, 
paper copies instead of just using the website. Uh, we're hoping to eventually either fund or find or develop a comprehensive calculator for customers to see all of their federal, state, and local incentives at once. Because right now we do have some links to Rewiring America's Inflation Reduction Act calculator, our own rebate programs, and some other incentive resources throughout all the categories. Um, and then at the very bottom of our webpage, we include energy saving tips for people looking for short term, low cost ways to reduce their electric bill. Uh, and we're constantly looking to expand that list with as many creative options as possible. So for transportation electrification, we as a utility haven't participated in the electrification of public transportation options, but that's one of many future avenues that could com come about to help make electric options a more accessible choice. Um, we are largely focused on personal vehicles and charging infrastructure at the moment. So Hainham Drives Electric is an existing outreach program managed by Energy New England's EV specialists to connect customers with programs, incentives, and electrification options. Uh, that program offers a free tool called the Drive and Save Wizard, which allows customers to fully price and compare electric vehicles. If they do buy electric, EV drivers can then help HMLP by charging their vehicles during the off-peak hours in the evenings when power costs are lower and there's less demand on the grid. HMLP offers a recurring monthly credit on the electric bill for participation in that. And then we also rebate charging equipment so that a customer can get that infrastructure in place. Thinking about people who cannot install a charger where they live for ownership or cost reasons, HMLP is working to expand public access charging in Hainham. Uh, we installed four public charging stations around Hainham this year, and there are more stations being installed next year. Uh, alongside Mass EVIP funds, HMLP also has a rebate program for businesses or commercial customers to help expand that network and install public stations on their property. And then if we want to go all electric, uh, we do need the power and resiliency to do so. So distributed energy resources, also known as DER, are sources of generation or storage that are connected within our electric grid. An example of this is solar energy on your building. HMLP provides a rebate of 60 cents a watt up to $6,000 for 10 kilowatts, and we allow net metering. Uh, in Hainham, the current net metering policy is to credit customers for the power they generate and send back into the grid based on the price we pay for energy on the market, which changes over time. Battery incentives and demand response are things that we want to get in place and are still trying to get a handle on, but HMLP believes that DER and demand response are two critical components to electrify Hingham. So hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to release options to customers that capitalize on the electrification opportunities and savings that these programs can provide. Yesterday, we actually signed an agreement with Energy Sage so that we can offer more educational resources to customers who are interested in getting solar or battery storage systems. So we are gonna be trying to put that information out soon. Um, I'll also say the evolution of our rates and our programs and policies over time is something that Hingham is constantly discussing and Electrify Hingham is gonna play a big role in that evolutionary process as a living program. Um, I am hopeful that we're going to continue finding solutions and opportunities to meet our mission goals over time, and that's going to come out of our partnerships. So we are owned by the ratepayers, and everything we do is intended to benefit them and fit into our mission statement, but nothing's perfect. Uh, we need to know what works and what doesn't and what's missing. We want to use Electrify Hingham as a communication tool to talk to customers at every possible turn. And then not only do we want to hear from our customers, but we want customers to hear from each other. There is a lot of power in connecting people to one another. When customers discuss why they went ahead on a heat pump project or solar installation, it is usually because one of their neighbors did it or they heard about it from a friend. So we want to link people together using Electrify Hingham, which is why we're going to start connecting our work on social media and encouraging people to tell others about what they're doing. Um, action steps are the same for every part of Electrify Hainham. People who want to take action can volunteer on the local town committees or private citizen groups that are helping to educate and motivate the community. The idea of Electrify Hainham itself actually came from Hainham Net Zero, a citizen group in the town that is full of organized and passionate individuals that want to see Net Zero become a reality for Hainham. Actually going electric and completing projects is something that we want to share, and HMLP is looking for testimonials, photos, videos, anything that gets the word out about what neighbors and friends are doing to go electric and be efficient. As HMLP does get its bearings on Electrify Hingham, we are going to be putting on more events, 
and looking for more engagement from people. Uh, municipal utilities also have public light board meetings every month that anyone can join and participate in. So on the last slide, I've put my contact information uh, if you would like to get in touch with me, but I'll also drop it in the chat box just in case you don't get a chance to copy it down. I'm happy to answer any questions later on and hear your thoughts and ideas. So thank you again for having me on tonight. Thank you, Brianna. That was that was really helpful and it's exciting to see all the all the great work taking place in in Hingham. Um, so I'm I'm conscious of time, so I will go over to our next and our final last but very much so not least speaker and that is uh, Kimberly French. Let me just make sure everything is set up. Uh, so Kimberly is, a, I will just say, a wonderful partner and, and someone that uh, MCAN works with a lot, so we are very happy to have her. Uh, she is also a team leader uh, for a local organization uh, in Middleborough called Sustainable Middleborough. Uh, and and uh, as, as part of that, she is, she is the team leader. Uh, and, and just a little bit about Sustainable Middleborough, it is a grassroots group uh, that works on local and state policy. And they have done quite a bit already. They have uh, successfully advocated for uh, the local util municipal utility uh, to say no to a, a biomass contract, uh, to move its electricity portfolio uh, from 27% to almost 70% non-emitting, uh, to be more accurate and transparent about that portfolio, and to better serve the town's environmental justice population. So it's all about that continued back and forth that makes that makes uh, MLP so so wonderful. Uh, in addition to her wonderful advocacy and, and uh, the, the entire organization's leadership um, in Middleborough, Kimberly is also an editor and a writer and uh, is, is always uh, working hard to ensure that that, that writing is a, is a part of, of the, acti uh, the activism that she's involved in. And that is something that I think we all can relate to as far as writing in, in this space. So with that, Kimberly, uh, thank you so much for being here, and I will let you take it away. Thank you, Logan, and thanks for all your help, too. Um, I live in a town with a lot of old, leaky housing. Uh, many of you may also. There are a lot of towns like that in our state. In Middleborough, more than half of our housing was built before 1960, which means it's often un- or under-insulated. This year, our group, Sustainable Middleborough, has been preparing for a campaign that we've just launched. We want to get as many homes insulated as we can over the next two years. Next slide, please. The state has designated the center of Middleborough as an environmental justice district because of low income, not because of race or language. Households in that census block uh, report a median income of just under $50,000, about 58% of the state's median income. About a third of our public school students are categorized as economically disadvantaged. In our town, the best and biggest next step we can take to reduce our emissions is weatherization. We really like working on energy efficiency here in our very conservative town. Uh, we all know that the only truly clean energy with, that doesn't have any environmental harm is the energy we don't use, but also energy efficiency cuts across the political divide. Next slide, please. Estimates are that, oh, too far. Um, estimates are that 25% to 45% of the energy used for heating and cooling the average house is lost to air leakage. That is like having a window open in your house all year long and just letting your money fly out the window. No one wants to lose money, but for people with limited income, people who may be forced to choose between food and heat in the winter, this is a justice issue. Low income houses in our state can qualify for the weatherization assistance program that some folks have already mentioned. That will pay 100% of weatherization costs up to a cap of $4,500. Lots of people who could qualify do not make use of this. Um, we've heard from folks who get along paying their bills and they, they don't wanna ask for fuel assistance, but they really could not take on a big home improvement project. 
Applying for weatherization assistance is really cumbersome. You have to first get income qualified for fuel assistance, and that takes a couple of months, and you have to do it only between November and April. And then you apply for the weatherization assistance. You don't have any control over who does the work. And if you're a tenant, your building owner can get assistance if more than half of the tenants are low income and everyone agrees on that. And you can imagine that's quite a process. And yet we are still making the case that for people who do qualify, it's worth getting in line because you can save hundreds every year on your heat with no upfront cost. Next slide, please. So here in a municipal utility town, there is another group that is very under-resourced, our many low moderate income residents throughout our town. As one of four towns with a municipal utility that provides both our electricity and our gas, no one in Middleborough is eligible for mass save rebates, which would pay 75% of insulation costs with no cap. We just heard about someone in another town that who got a $6,000 rebate on an $8,000 insulation job. So our utility has a 50 has a rebate for 50% of the cost of insulation with a cap of $1,000. For low moderate income residents who don't qualify for fuel assistance, there's no way they could spring for that a big insulation job like that with just a $1,000 incentive. We feel our rebates are mostly a sweetener for people who are very motivated or who probably could afford it anyway. So we've been asking, oh, sorry, not quite yet. So we are asking our utility for a bigger energy efficiency budget, much bigger incentives for low, low moderate income residents and using some of that budget to pay interest on 0% on loans for energy retrofits, a low income rate and a process for public output. And we're very happy to report that in 2022, the utility increased that budget 25% from 30 from 300,000 to 400,000. Um, this past June, our general manager announced a commitment to both a low income rate and tiered rebates. Um, we also sat down with the utility staff and they said they were actively talking about all of our asks. This week, we saw the 2023 budget and it's got another $68,000 increase and for the first time, a line item to target low moderate income incentives. We're very happy with all these strides and really appreciate our utility and, and we feel, feel very listened to. We don't know any of the details yet. So that's, that's yeah, next slide. So we, we believe that outreach about financial help that is available um, to our low moderate income residents really needs to be stepped up a lot. Um, we got an Empower grant from the Mass Clean Energy Center to put together a weatherization guide. Um, our first step was to reach out to about 15 low income service providers. And we asked some of them to be um, to serve as an advisory group for us, the Council on Aging, the School Resource Officer, the Food Pantry, the uh, WIC, and the YMCA. And they told us about some of the same barriers that Gabe mentioned, things like mistrust of contractors or auditors and fear of losing other benefits and uh, they also told us to keep it simple, emphasize that the audits are free, and they advised us that, you know, different groups, parents and WIC recipients and seniors use all different kinds of communication forms. Next slide. Um, we also hired a researcher, Brian Stanley, who I think is here tonight, who is um, um, in a new environmental justice master's program at Brandeis. And we also hired a, a designer, Katie Metz, who helped us create a really fun infographic brochure that's being distributed by our partners throughout town. Uh, we're working on a website that will include our full weatherization guide. Uh, in January, we'll be mailing a postcard to our environmental justice area. We also plan to do canvassing there. Um, we've been modeling this campaign after a similar one in um, Pittsfield by the Berkshire Environmental Advocacy Team, and they've been advising us. Next slide. So uh, we launched Insulate Middleborough on October 22nd with a workshop. Um, we got our select board to proclaim October Energy Efficiency Month. That took a little bit of, of doing, but we got it. And uh, we invited Loie Hayes. I saw Loie was on, on, the, on the Zoom tonight. Um, from She's the Energy Efficiency Specialist from Green Energy Consumers Alliance. And uh, we, we had a very beautiful October Saturday, but we still had a great turnout. Loie was great. Um, she is so knowledgeable and she told us about the um, coming federal um, rebates and tax credits that are that are um, because of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed back in August. 
Um, and our state senator, Mark Pacheco, showed up, which was nice. Um, so one of the things we've been uh, feel like is a good tool and that we were doing at that workshop is telling stories um, about, I think Rihanna mentioned that too, about how people who have insulated in town and how much they've saved. One of our members, uh, Paul Singley, he, he is the founder of a local machine shop. He bought a cottage on a pond here and um, it was heated with propane, which cost a fortune. And so um, he had a contractor blow in insulation in the walls but they were just four inches thick, not the typical six inches. So when it was time to side it, put siding on, he put another one and a half inches of foam board under um, that siding. And then since then, and that cut his heat bill a lot. And then since then he's added a heat pump and he's added a um, so solar. And he tells us that his energy costs for the year is, are just $300 for everything. So that's quite, quite a story and very impressive, Paul. So in addition to um, the outreach part, we are there are three other pieces to our campaign. Um, next slide. So back in January, our select board opted into um, a mass development financing program called PACE for Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, after a lot of our advocacy, our town employees were a little hesitant about it. And I wanna say shout out, thanks to Kristen Dupre at a previous Muni sum Summit for urging us to do this. We became one of the first 60 or so towns to opt in. Um, I'm not gonna explain the whole thing. It's pretty complicated, but it's a financial tool that can bring a lot of money into town for large rehab projects and energy retrofits. And that can include multifamily housing. Next slide. We've also partnered with the schools to get a grant to put on a cooler Middleborough Fair this coming spring. And I wanna shout out to Brad Hubbard Nelson of MCAN for telling us about this one. Um, students will be competing in an energy efficiency challenge like a science fair. And then, uh, and we'll be including our eighth grade civic students to do advocacy about um, energy. About energy, And it will also, it'll be a way to get parents and kids attention. Local groups and vendors can also provide info and demo on their work. Um, and we're in discussion just this week with a group based in our town, the New England Coastal Wildlife Association. They are the, some of the folks who help with marine um, animal strandings. And they're applying for a local cultural council grant uh, to put on a biodiversity um, day. So we're looking for a way to combine these two events because we want to get their big inflatable whale at our event, at our fair too. So that, that, that will be really fun, I think. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing we're doing is we are continuing our legislative advocacy. We're really making energy efficiency the focus. Uh, we have a Google group of more than 200 people who make calls and write emails and sign on to letters. Um, our state Senator Mark Pacheco sponsored the Justice with Jobs bill this past session, which would have funded energy retrofits in environmental justice neighborhoods, immigration gateway cities, and municipal utility towns. He has two in his district. Um, we'll be looking closely at the bills when they come out in January to find the ones that really support energy efficiency. And I just want to give a shout out here on this slide because um, the, our leadership team is about six people. And I just want to say who they are. And the second photo there in Governor Baker's hallway, um, the second and third person on the left are Patty Simon and Sandra, Sandra Smiley. Um, in the picture on the right with Senator Pacheco, we've got Jeff Stevens, Dodie Atkins, Perry, and Alan Melchior. These people are amazing, our leadership team. They write and call and write grants and research and stand up at meetings and talk and organize. And you know, all of this would not be possible without these volunteers. So I just wanna mention them. Um, so next slide, we do have several challenges and concerns. If we succeed at getting residents to apply for weatherization assistance and getting audits, we're worried that we're just maybe setting them up for frustration. This fall, there are long waits to get a call back and even longer to get an appointment with both weatherization assistance and for an audit with Energy New England. Um, a lot of our own people have actually had experiences that make us question the quality of the audits sometimes. And one of our goals is to know, nudge both those organizations as well as our own utility to join us and step up their outreach work and make this process a lot easier. Um, another, the second issue we have is when we give public money to building owners to weatherize, what is to prevent them from raising rents and pushing low-income people out? 
we have not seen a model for how to handle this or prevent it. And we'd like to see some provisions that if a building owner uses money like PACE or weatherization assistance or utility rebates, then they can't raise rents on current tenants, say, for more than the inflation rate over a certain number of years. And there's a lot of room for advocacy here. And the third thing is we have bitten off a lot. It is really stretching the limits of our volunteer power. We're telling residents that they need to have patience and persistence to get those weatherization incentives, but it's good advice for all of us as advocates, especially that persistence part. So a big part of this work is just showing up and asking for what you want over and over. So our main message is just keep organizing, keep showing up and persist. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for, for that wonderful presentation and for all the, the incredible advocacy um, that, that you have been doing um, in Middleborough. I want to thank also all of this, the incredible speakers that joined us tonight. I was just, I, I knew what was coming and it still was, was so impressive and I think was really helpful as far as providing a picture of what's happening what needs to happen and how we can uh, continue to move forward um, through working with, with uh, mu municipal utilities uh, across the Commonwealth. Um, so I am conscious of time and I imagine that there are several questions that folks have. So I'm going to forgo uh, my questions and I may kind of mix them in uh, to the fold. Um, but at this time, I, I will make it possible for folks to unmute themselves. And, and, you know, it's always great to hear people ask their questions. So I see there are a few questions in the chat. Um, and I also see that that hands are starting to go up. So be sure to uh, to use the hand function and, and you'll um, uh, and or you can just raise your hand or, or say in the chat that you have a question um, and and we will go from there. And so I'm going to kick things off by, by starting with, with Laura Burns. Laura, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, Kristen, it's so nice to see you. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about the solar support services that Abode offers, because in Hingham, we've had tremendous luck with the heat pump coaching. We're going to keep right on doing that. But I know that Brianna gets a lot of calls from people saying, how do I put solar on my house? And tell us what you, tell us about the services you provide. Uh, so right now um, we are offering that for Middleborough. Um, we provide both weatherization uh, consulting and, and solar consulting. And that's the only town we're really doing it for. Um, you know, Energy Sage, um, has a great service. Um, it it, it kind of makes sense for us, like where we're where we're already providing um, consulting services just to expand those conversations because often when we're talking about heat pumps, it leads into um, water heating and solar and um, you know all decarbonization or electric technologies so like in one phone one phone call kind of leads to another um so it makes sometimes it makes sense for us to do that we have people on staff that are qualified to do to do that um so that's that's what we're offering right now and also um you know i mentioned the training that we were doing that we're doing for advocates um it's around heat pumps but we're also doing water heating, solar, electric vehicles. It's part of it. it's it's part of the same conversation, you know. And good to see you too, Laura. Great. And just really quickly, because I see that there's there's something. Uh, who pays for your services, Kristen? Just for clarification, and then we'll move. Um, for our MLP programs, the utility pays for our services, um, and then we also have communities too, um, that the towns pay for our services, but also like in non MLP towns, um, we do have, we do uh, have a market rate service where you can go to our website and pay directly. Great. Thank you so much. And Jerry, I see your hand is raised. So we'll go to you and then we'll go to, uh, read after that. Well, thank you. And, um, I'm just, 
uh, thrilled by the talks tonight because um, I've started a little program trying to look for examples to comparing MLPs that are moving forward and those that are less uh, aggressive ab ab about electrification. And so I've gotten some really great examples tonight. Uh, what the question I have, um, what motivates an MLP to take these kinds of initiative and promote heat pumps and work towards zero carbon and um, do all of these wonderful uh, and complicated steps working with the community and, and with the MLP, how does it get started? And, and you know, can we copy this? That, that's a great question. And, and maybe if it's okay with, with everyone, Brianna, maybe would you mind taking a, a stab? And then I'd love to also hear from Kimberly. Yeah, so I mean, I, I would just say the citizen engagement that we have in Hingham has definitely motivated everything that we're doing. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, Electrify Hingham as a concept was brought to us by Hingham Net Zero, which is this big group. I think they have a mailing list of 200 people and the actual core group of people that's doing things is a lot less, but they just, they pushed this forward and they wrote down all of the ideas for us. And they just, they said, we really wanna see this happen. And we sat down with them and had conversations about it. And we tried to put something in place that we felt was gonna work for people. Um, and I, I just think that that kind of continuous engagement, I've had Hainham Net Zero people and other citizens just continue to follow up and ask us, why are you not offering this? You know, when the heat pump rebates started to get raised at different MLPs, we had a lot of customers calling and we still get customers calling, um, asking us, you know, why are we not doing more on that? And uh, we completely, you know, when that happens, when we get those phone calls, not only do I recognize it, but everyone that works at HMLP recognizes it. Um, everyone that's in the utility sphere sees that. They see that customers are reaching out. So it's definitely important. I actually live in Hull, Massachusetts. So you might know the Hull light plant. Um, there's wonderful people that work there too, but the engagement in Hull is a lot different where we don't have that same kind of like intense citizen group uh, level of involvement and advocacy that that I see in Hingham. So I, I would personally love more rebates from my light plant. Um, and I just have those two perspectives to compare. And I think that everyone's trying to do work, but the amount of pushing that you get in, in a positive direction is, is so important from citizens. Thank you. And Kimberly, go for yeah. it. Well, I I think I would concur with what Brianna said. I think that it, citizen engagement, advocacy is probably a lot of it. And when I think, when I look at like the MCAN report card, I think the places where you see the most progress what in whatever the clean energy issue is are places where there is a lot of advocacy. And I certainly have learned from people in Hingham, like Laura and other towns too, um, Concord, Belmont, et cetera. Um, I, I would say that, you know, our light plant, I think, um, I mean, I do think that the 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 will is there. I think they're good people, really competent people, especially I mean, the, especially the managers. And they they were the ones I think we first sat down with them four years ago, who really identified the this issue of old leaky housing and how do you um, how do you you know deal with it. And I feel like we give give them cover in a way to to really address it because we keep we keep coming back to meetings and saying this is what we want we want low income rate we want tiered rebates you know we want you to address this we have this big low moderate income population and and that we feel listened to it's it's happening so i th i think it's yeah it's all about citizen engagement and advocacy from my perspective too i and, just wanted to Oh, oh, good. Go for it, Gabe. I was just going to no, chime no, in. This is it. not my role in this call, but having having worked with MLPs as my clients on electrification, there is actually like this is a home run for MLPs. Like, there's an economic um, incentive for them to to have people switch their heating fuel from delivered fuels or natural gas to electricity. Uh, so, like those those rebates that they provide have an ROI to the to the MLP. So this is like one of those confluences of. The financial incentives are are actually leading MLPs to do um, the environmental friendly thing too. So it's like a really, a really same for electric vehicles. A really great opportunity for, for MLPs. I I think that's that's a very important point. And and one thing I just want to add because I you know I I'm aware of of ongoing efforts taking place in, across several communities, but these things do take time. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes I think we, we recognize that, that we want to see change, you know, fast change. And it's, it's wonderful to see that, that MLP communities are, you know, listening to their, their customers um, and, and to, to their interests. And it also is important, as Kimberly highlighted, to continue to persist. So, you know, it, 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 it does take time. It takes continued advocacy. Um, and, and I know sometimes that can be challenging, but, but we heard how, how important that is. Um, I want to go to Reed, and then I have a question for all of the panelists that I, I would love to, to get answered. And then I, I saw there are several questions from Robert, so I will uh, maybe, maybe uh, have one of those uh, highlighted. Uh, take it away, Reed. And I'm not sure if you're trying to unmute yourself, Reed. All right. Oh, can you... Reed, I think we can hear you now. Give it a try. For some reason, we're not able to hear you. So I am going to move on. But if you want to put something in the chat, please do. And, and we can... Uh, we can go ahead and, and try to try to get to it there. So my question for the panelists, and, and it is a broad question, um, but you know, thinking forward, if there was one thing you know in in your mind that uh, an an MLP could do uh, to enhance its equitable efforts to electrify and increase weatherization, what would it be? Um, and you know, feel free to expand. But I think we just have such a diverse group of folks, you know, who come at this from, from different angles, that it would be really wonderful to, to get your perspective. How can we continue to move forward? And I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give folks a chance to unmute themselves so they also have a time to think if, if they need to, to make sure they come up with one. Kristen, go for it. Okay, well, my answer to this is actually rapidly changing. Um, in even in the, like the last month, as I've um, learned more about the low income program in Massachusetts and given additional thought to uh, to that question, so um, I, I think um, uh, I, you know I would have said uh, for pro providing funding for weatherization or um, you know increasing access or whatever, but. Um, I really feel like we need to focus on um, the how the substandard housing stock and work on mitigation. Um, we need to we need to get rid of like knob and tube wiring. We need to you know throughout the state, and we need to weatherize those homes and get that that you know substandard housing stock up to par, so that then they can you know, be electrification ready. Um, so, um, you know, I think that we have to set the foundation at this point and we're not there yet. So uh, if MLPs could work, I uh, maybe strengthen the relationships with the local cap agencies. Um, you know, Mass Save gives dollars to the cap agencies in addition to what they get from the federal government. Um, so the cap agencies will use the federal funds that they'll pick from the buckets of funds to uh, have the most efficient use of that money. Um, but when it comes to MLP towns, there's only the federal dollars. Some towns like Middleborough, uh, a handful of MLP towns do annually give money to the local uh, cap agency just for that. Um, and it's really money well spent because it, when that's not being done, um, I believe, I think it's somewhere like around $1,200 uh, per home can be used for remediation. And so um, it, a, a, a house in an MLP town, like the, the, the average amount is $10,000 worth of cost to get those houses up to where they need to be. So what happens is those houses don't get serviced. That they twelve hundred dollars doesn't go far. The repairs don't happen. Weatherization doesn't happen, and that money goes towards 
non MLP towns, right? So mm. I, you know, I think there's the, a, a real problem that's been brewing for a long time in these MLP towns that we need to solve for. Absolutely, that's a, a great a great response and definitely uh, a, a big challenge. Um, does anyone else want to add into this? I'll, I'll, add, I'll add something. I am, yes, I'm very pleased that Middleborough contributes. We just got that budget, I think 80,000 this year to the, to our weatherization mm -hmm. assistance program. Um, so I'll, I'm going to borrow something from our, one of our conversations with our state senator, which is he, he, and that I think is a very intriguing idea. He suggested that you know, as part of being a public service, our public power companies should consider having a clean energy division. And I don't know what that would look like totally, but but really take some much more of this on and offer it as a public service. I find that a very intriguing idea. I mean, I, I'm again, I don't know how to implement it, but um, I, it's, it's something I'll just throw out there on the table. And I, I think I definitely agree with, with uh, Kristen on like, there's a lot, to be done programmatically to make equitable electrification and weatherization viable. But if you were to have a program, I think, you know, some of the things I mentioned before about making sure there are connections with local community groups that have, could, could provide access to the types of residents that, um, that that would benefit or being left out of programs. Um, it's sometimes hard, like Kimberly and her group of volunteers are doing like amazing work, but like often, the, those groups are not necessarily representative of some of the underserved or like immigrant populations, like who might not think to or to have the capacity to be volunteers. So like paid outreach work is often necessary to like close those equity gaps uh, for those populations. Um, those are just a couple of things that that came to mind. Yeah, it's a I, really good point. Oh, go for it, Brianna. Sorry, I just want to say that every, I agree with everything that everyone's saying. Um, and I feel like Utilities have always had this really traditional idea of what a utility is, you know, what they're what they're there to do. And I think equity is this whole new conversation that utilities are just starting to um, comprehend and listen to. And I think that, you know, we're we're gonna see strategies coming out. I, I certainly don't know all of the strategies that that need to go into place. Um, and I think that like demographics of a town go into that and all sorts of things. But um, I, I just think it'll be interesting to see how utilities, you know, come to adapt and and really expand their equity considerations. Because right now, I you know, utilities were in this space where I think that they're really breaking out of, well, what is what is an MLP do? What does it traditionally mean to be an MLP? And then what is what should it mean to be an MLP? So Absolutely. And, and, and that is, that is important, you know, that, that this is an ever evolving conversation and, and uh, you know, it, it's really something that, uh, that we can, you know, continue, continue to work on. It's, it's, it's all about collaboration and, and partnership with, with uh, you know, for the advocates with, with local, the local MLPs um, to help, to help kind of identify what, what, you know, you all want to see in, in, in your MLPs as part of this, because they're, they're, you know, the conversation is, is really starting to happen. Um, I see a question from Robert that I actually think is very, is very important. And I know there are a few. So, so Robert, I'm, I'm going to get to, to the, actually the first one that you mentioned, um, but it gets to tracking and, you know, he asks, once we've been able to, to get heat pumps installed, what are we doing to, to, uh, to affect to track the effectiveness in achieving the goals we advocated uh, for, and you know, I want to kind of uh, extend that to uh, to both you know emissions reductions, energy reductions, but then also equity. Um, and I'd be curious to get feedback on either what's happening or or what could and should happen to it to better enable um, you know uh, uh, progress in these areas. Can you repeat the beginning of the question? Sure. So, so it's it's kind of you know once we do this work, um, and maybe I can yeah. So once we do this work, um, how are we tracking the progress? You know, and how are we essentially tracking whether or not we we are successful 
the extent to which our programs are succeeding, um, how often they're being used, uh, et cetera. And, and basically, I, you know, I was suggesting tracking around both um, the energy savings and, and emissions reductions, as well as on the equity side. Um, so we've actually done some work with some of the utilities that have um, like AMI data that we can actually see if heat pumps are being utilized, uh, optimized for utilization, right? And, and what we found is that we need additional education because they're not being utilized as well as they can be. What happens in the, in the small study that we found was that on the second weather, cold weather event of the year, the heat pump, many heat pumps went off for good for the winter and didn't come back on until April, you know? So, um, because, you know, people need confirmation, like, hey, it's okay to leave it on, you know, under 30 degrees, you know, but a lot of times their installer will tell them that the, you know, to use your backup system at a certain temperature, right? Um, so there's things like that, that, you, you know, people often don't even utilize them correctly. They do setbacks at night and all this stuff. They don't, they, they're not instructed from the installer and how to, that there's a different way to use them. So, um, and the education of these new technologies doesn't stop, it needs to go on after the installation. But we can um, we can do studies like that. Like, um, you know, we, we're we working in two different programs to put monitors in, to, to monitor our, our heat pumps giving us the savings that, you know, the HPSF, HSPF rating says they're going to, right? Um, so we, the whole industry needs to do more of that. And there's lots of those going on right now, right? Um, it, NYSERDA is doing some stuff. Mass, uh, there's uh, Mass NEEP, I think, is doing stuff. So there's a couple of these different studies going on, and that's all really important. And then the other thing is just having program KPIs um, in general that are meaningful and that we we collect data and we track to it and make sure that, you know, as we're, you know, implementing these programs and, and designing the programs that we, you know, we design them with meaningful KPIs and then we track to them and then we learn and we iterate and we, things are gonna change over time. Um, we found that with our programs like two years ago, we've made changes because we've learned and we, We've had, you know, we we we're trying to be impactful, and as the as we're learning more about the technology and how the technology is being utilized, we also have to, um, so, you know, change the way we think and and you know pivot a little bit to make sure that we're we're providing you know effective, impactful services. I was just going to jump in on the on tracking equity. Um, it is. Uh it's hard to track things that you're not measuring. Like if you're not collecting demographic data, it's going to be hard to, to track that. Uh, one of the things that we've been looking at on the 30 communities we're working on with the, the Massive program is um, we have participation data by like the census block group level. And you can really overlay that with some of the like environmental justice population. So I think at the very least, um, if you don't want to like do a demographic survey or collect income data, if there's no incentive for additional incentive for income eligible folks uh you could at least look at the different census tracts and like where in the community rebates are going and kind of overlay that with average median incomes and other uh diversity metrics for, that is publicly available is at least one one way to get started it's a really good point and and i will also add in here this is this may be uh have been a, a leading question because because m can certainly you know uh, has done some done some research on this as part of our scorecard. And I think one thing that we have found is there are still a number of MLPs that are not tracking, you know, uh, like Kristen was was mentioning, just the the progress and kind of the the adoption of um, 
the, the utilization of the programs and then as a result, the energy savings. And I think that that is, is a really important starting point and thinking about, to, to Gabe's point, how that data can be collected in a way that tracks and identifies what program, you know, who is using what programs is really important to understanding, is this working? Is this equitably, you know, are the, are, are the benefits that we're providing being equitably distributed? So we recognize that there are some challenges, there are some limitations, there are some privacy concerns, but it's a real opportunity for MLPs to be creative about this and, and to, to really uh, monitor and, and lead the way in monitoring, um, uh, you know, kind of how, how uh, and where these, these benefits are going. Um, so I see we have about two minutes left and uh, Reed, I think you, do you wanna give it a, another try? Yes, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Great, fantastic. Hey, um, I wanna thank you for giving me a second shot and I wanna thank uh, all of the participants for uh, opening my eyes to the breadth of the challenges. I'm sorry you see my name up there, but no picture, but um, rest assured I'm a person. Um, my question has to do with the end state that we are trying to get to. And as somebody who has followed um, alternative energy decarbonization, climate change for years and years, and as somebody who um, has a solar array and a battery, in my home, I am concerned that I see us um, reinforcing a highly centralized system of energy creation and energy distribution. And the heat pump solution is really only one enhancement to that centralization. Where is or what is the place of a highly decentralized energy grid where individual households, buildings can set up solar installations or multiple sources of energy and interact with each other. That's the real vision of resilience, redundancy, risk management, and decarbonization. It's happening in Europe. I spend six months of the year in Europe. This is their vision. Our vision seems to be about greater centralization and utility monopolies. I'd like to hear anybody respond to that concern. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in and I, I'll just say that I think that, um, you know, with, with the development of demand response programs, that's, in my view, the current attempt to try to add some decentralization to the system to give homeowners and building owners the ability to generate power and to store that power, to have resiliency against weather events and things like that. I, um, you know, the M Hainum light can't grow beyond Hainum in a sense. So we, we can only be so, I guess, big and powerful. But, uh, you know, to a certain extent, we also want customers to have that kind of, of freedom to, to be able to generate their own power and to do so in a way that makes them feel confident in their own home system, I suppose. Um, so I don't know if that's really answering your whole question. I just, that's kind of what, I, what I'm thinking along the lines of is, is demand response and the development of battery technology and things, you know, really putting power in the, in the hands of, of property owners um, and just seeing if what, you know, if people are gonna take that up and install it on their on their property and be that little microgrid on the system that you know when the power goes down they're unaffected so that's that's what i i'm thinking of this is certainly not my area of expertise either but i i do work with some communities um in chelsea and boston that are that are doing some microgrid work um this organization that we work with climbable is supporting uh those microgrid projects and i think they're pretty interesting it's not quite on the residential level but like on the community level which i think is um provide some of the same resiliency benefits um so go go check out check those out as well yeah thank you yeah that's great great well thank you thank you so much for that question and thank you everyone for for being here and for um 
for, for taking the time out of the evening to hear from these incredible presenters. And I do wanna finally thank our presenters. This was such a helpful and educational um, uh, presentation. And I hope everyone felt, felt the same. Um, I want to I, I want to respect everyone's time, and so I so I will end it here. But I just want to keep everyone, you know, keep just encourage everyone to uh, keep keep posted on on kind of next events and and upcoming Muni summits. Uh, we are going to continue doing this and continue highlighting these important issues and these challenges and these unique opportunities that exist within the the MLP communities. And we rely on experts like everyone on this panel. Um, to help us in, in spreading the word and better understanding how we can uh, take action at the local level. So thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you, thank Logan. You. Thank you, everyone. All right, everyone.